Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Doug Mitchell. I have the distinct privilege of serving as the executive director of the Glacier National Park Conservancy. It's so fun to get together every couple of months and have these glacier conversations with each other. Great way to catch up with each other. Also a great way to learn about the important work that you are making happen in Glacier National Park. And we couldn't be more delighted tonight to be joined by Brooke Bannerman, who has been working on a very important project to all of us, which is water quality in Lake McDonald. Brooke, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Give you a little bit of background. I mentioned that Brooke is, um, is from Bellingham, Washington, went to high school in Bellingham, continued through the uh, Quick Start program uh, at went to go to Western Washington, where she received both her bachelor's degree and master's degree, uh, and is now uh, a U of M Grizzly getting her PhD uh, there, and that is going to be in systems ecology. Is that right? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so it, it's really terrific to be able to have you. I'm also joined tonight by Andrew Smith and Gracie Regala, the best team in the business. Um, Gracie is uh, going to be doing <clears throat> questions. So please put questions in the chat and uh, Gracie is going to help moderate some of those questions. We got a couple of giveaways today as well. We're going to give away a couple of books that we have in the glacier.org and in our bookstores. Um, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, Brooke was kind enough to put together a presentation uh, for us tonight. And so without further ado, Brooke, I'm going to hand it over to you and um, let you share your screen and, and uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, contemporary limnological sampling in Lake McDonald. Yeah, okay. Let me get organized here. All right. Is everyone seeing a PowerPoint? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, well, first, thank you for having me. Um, appreciate the introduction. My name is Brooke, uh, soon to be formally Bannerman, uh, soon to be Bain White. I'm in the process of legal name change. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Montana. And over the last three years, as part of my PhD research, I've been doing a three-part series of projects in Glacier, completely supported by the Glacier National Park Conservancy and its very generous donors. And I'm really excited today to be able to share with you a little bit on each of these projects. I'm going to try to keep this within 20 minutes, but there's a slight chance I go over. I won't be able to share all of which I want to share with you, but hopefully we can do some follow-up in the months and years to come. I do want to give a shout out to my advisor down here at the University of uh, Montana, uh, Dr. Ashley Ballantyne, and my co-investigators on this project, Dr. Jim Elser, who's the director of the Flathead Lake Biological Station, and Chris Downs, who's inspired all of this work, and he is the aquatic and physical science lead at Glacier. Um, so as I was preparing for this talk this evening, I was listening to some of the previously recorded conversations, and uh, Doug said something along the lines of, the purpose of the Conservancy is to connect people, purpose, and park. And so I'm hoping that what you get from this talk this evening is a little bit more about who I am and what inspires me and kind of how I got here, what I'm passionate about, how I've applied that in the park, what I'm doing, where I'm doing it, and a little bit about what I found. And I know this is an ambitious agenda, so we'll try to get through it. Um, so my origin story is that I was born, raised, and schooled in the beautiful town of Bellingham, Washington, which is in northwestern Washington state, shown here. Um, a lot of people know it as the city of subdued excitement. Um, others know it as a, a mecca for mountain biking and snowboarding, both of which I do. Um, but really, it wasn't my hobbies that in inspired me to pursue a career in environmental science and resources management. Um, it was really my late grandfather who's shown on the left here. Um, after obtaining my bachelor's degree in environmental science from Western in 2013, I worked for a graduate student in North Cascades National Park. Um, and that's really what inspired me to go back and do a graduate degree of my own. So I went back to Western. I really just couldn't get enough of it. And I started pursuing my master's degree in 2014. I ended up studying the ways in which abandoned hard rock mines in 
the middle of the North Cascades range, a picture of which is shown here on the right, and contemporary suction dredging operations were influencing the chemistry and the biological communities in high elevation streams. And here's me sampling some water, just as an example. I graduated with my degree in, or my MS degree in environmental science in uh, 2017. And really it was a uh, nomadic life after that. Uh, for anyone who's been an aspiring ecologist or limnologist, which that's the first term I'll share with you all tonight, that's the study of inland waters. Um, so inspiring limnologists, they have to bounce around between a lot of seasonal jobs. And so to make that possible, um, my now spouse and I purchased our first home on wheels in true millennial fashion. This is Priscilla. And she enabled us to bounce around to different places in the West and work some of the coolest jobs you can possibly work. Um, so I participated in the um, EPA's National Lakes Assessment in Washington State. I worked for Crater Lake National Park. And really, it was my work with the Klamath Monitoring Network um, in the parks of Southern Oregon and Northern California that inspired me to go back and do a PhD where I would be studying the ways that wildfire affects high elevation lakes. And that's really what landed me here at the University of Montana. Soon after admissions to the University of Montana, I was introduced to Chris Downs, who's shown here on the right. It's all happy smiles when we're on the boat in beautiful weather. And he told me about some concerning water quality surveys um, in Lake McDonald. And I asked him immediately, well, what does the long-term lake monitoring suggest could be the cause? And that's when I learned that there was no long-term lake monitoring program in the park, which was a shock to me given my work history and that which I know about the national park system. But I know an opportunity when it's presented to me and I pitched the idea that I could do the lakes research in the park that he was seeking answers for. And so began the three projects that I'm going to present to you tonight. Um, so all of these, I will reiterate, were supported by the Glacier National Park and Service. They made this possible and really they made my PhD possible. So you have all my gratitude. Um, so to start, we're going to talk about Lake McDonald. We will talk about other lakes in the park, but I know this is the, the group favorite. So we're gonna start here. So really the question, what we were asking for this part of the research is, is Lake McDonald becoming more eutrophic? And I know that's kind of a jargony and technical term, but what we're saying here is, is Lake McDonald becoming more nutrient rich, enriched, productive, and is water clarity declining as a result? So the background is that we put lakes on what we call a trophic status gradient, where the extreme is a lake is nutrient poor, it sustains very little algal growth as a result, and it has high water clarity. Usually this is where mountain lakes fall. Um, and then the other extreme is that you can be an eutrophic lake, and that has high concentrations of nutrients, high algal productivity, and low water, water, wa low water clarity as a result. And this can be a natural process, but human activities tend to exacerbate this. Um, so, although I told you there's no long-term lake monitoring program in the park, that doesn't mean that there hasn't been surveys of Lake McDonald previously. And so that's the data I'm showing here, you here on the left, and the organizations that have conducted the surveys are shown here on the right. Um, all of this data comes from water quality samples that were collected in the middle of the lake at the deepest part of the lake, that is convention and limnological studies. And what you're looking at here is four parameters that we used to designate the trophic status of a lake. So that's concentration of total phosphorus, concentration of total nitrogen, concentration of chlorophyll A, which is the photosynthetic pigment that's an algae, and secchi depth. So if you don't know what a secchi disc is, highly technical piece of equipment, it is a black and white disc that you lower in the water column and the lower it can go in the water column the greater the water clarity. So you want deep, deep secchi deaths, low concentrations of chlorophyll A, and low concentrations of nutrients to be an oligotrophic lake. By the historical lake standards, Lake McDonald was oligotrophic, 
but it was really this 2018 survey that was initiated by the park that caused these original concerns. We saw quite a jump in concentration of total phosphorus during this survey. And this is particularly concerning because phosphorus tends to be the limiting nutrient in lakes. And so we would expect algal growth to proliferate as a result. Not only was the middle of the lake sampled that year, but the lake perimeter was sampled. And that's what's shown in this map. So don't take too much time interpreting that. We don't have a lot of time, but to kind of orient you, this is Lake McDonald. Apgar would be down here. Going to the Sun Road runs adjacent to this. This is where the lodge is. And these points are where water samples were taken. The bigger the point, the higher the concentration of nutrient in that sample. I took all of these values, including the mid-lake samples, and created an average. And that's what I'm showing you here. The average for total nitrogen was not terribly alarming. It's still within the oligotrophic range, as is designated by this dotted line. But the concentration of total phosphorus was well above that boundary, which suggested that perhaps the lake was becoming more eutrophic. And ultimately, that would lead to this two-year study that we've been conducting with the support of the Conservancy. That included a lot of water, water, water quality sampling of the lake, bi-monthly sampling. Very fun. I get to go out on the middle of the lake with Chris Downs in their NPS vessel, use a series of contraptions to take a bunch of water out of the lake, take that water back to the Flathead Lake Biological Station, set it up to some filtration apparatus, filter forever, I mean forever, like till three o'clock in the morning forever, <laughs> end up with a bunch of filters, put a bunch of water into bottles, and then wait for about eight to nine months for these samples to be analyzed and the data to come back. But I'm what I'm very pleased to share with you is that data. So we have data both from 2022 and 2023 that I plotted on that same graph. And I am thrilled to report that Lake McDonald remains oligotrophic. The nutrient concentrations have gone down, particularly the nutrient, the total phosphorus concentrations have gone down back within that historic range of variability. This is great news. Okay. Not only did we sample the deepest portion of the lake, that's where these data are from. We also did that perimeter sampling, which I showed you in that map. And here's a fun, well, I hope fun video of Chris Downs and I on the lake capturing a water sample. Chris Downs, we're at Kelly Camp North, lowering down the Van Dorn, 10 meters. And your mark, and it doesn't down on messenger. Messenger's not stripping Van Dorn to close it. Or water sample at 30 feet. Bingo. Bingo. Um, so we repeated these samplings in 2023. Um, so in July and September of 2023, we went to all those sites around the lake perimeter and did the sampling. And I just got that data back. Again, I did a, a composite mean. So all the sites around the lake, what was the mean? Uh, total nitrogen and total phosphorus concentration. And I found that there has been a 67% reduction in the concentration of total nitrogen throughout the lake. And there has been a 92% reduction in the concentration of total phosphorus in the lake. This is exactly what we want to hear, right? Um, so to the original question, is Lake McDonald becoming more eutrophic? Based on our data, it appears not. But this doesn't answer <laughs> that critical question is what happened? Um, why did we see the nutrient enrichment that we detected in 2018? And so what my research team and I did was come up with a list of possible reasons why we saw that jump in, particularly total phosphorus in the lake. Um, some of those explanations were methodological error, because there is not a long-term monitoring program in the place, standard protocols aren't necessarily implemented across the board. We checked the methods and there was no discrepancies between the ways water samples were collected and analyzed all those years from the different agencies, which was great news. So we eliminated that to the best of our ability. Um, we also considered septic, which we're gonna talk about next. And then there was some environmental variables we considered. So. 
nutrients can rain down from the atmosphere in rain and snow, and also in dry deposition as dust. We looked at regional collectors and we didn't see evidence for an increase in deposition or nutrient deposition that would cause a fertilization effect of the lake. We also didn't think it was glacial meltwater. Lake McDonald is a glaciated watershed, but because that 2018 uh, series of samples appeared to be an episodic, a blip, it doesn't appear that glacial meltwater is continuing to be a problem in this watershed or continuing to be an enrichment problem in this watershed. So we eliminated that from the list for now. So the two other things I wanna discuss is septic and wildfire. So septic is something that uh, is considered along the shores of Lake McDonald because there's a series of private end holdings, some of which are shown on this map. And in 2007, the Flathead Lake Biological Station initiated what's called a tracer dye study. So they supplied a fluorescent dye to the private residents along the shores of Lake McDonald. And those folks flushed this dye down their toilets and through their la uh, laundering machines. And in that process, that was distributed through their septic system. And then those researchers circled the lake and visited the middle of the lake to see if they could pick up on that dye. They also collected water samples at those locations to look at concentrations of nutrients and algal biomass. And what they found was no strong indications of a widespread septic issue. This is a direct quote from this study. The study confirmed only one location of complete septic system failure along the Lake McDonald shoreline. In this case, the park acted immediately to correct the issue um, because it was a significant health risk. And while this site was identified as having increased nutrients and algal biomass in the lake prior to the 2007 tracer dye study, it is not the only site in which ele there's elevated nutrients and algal growth. And they suggested that the elevated nutrients and algal growth in these other locations could be the result of natural processes, such as increased loading from the burn forest along the Howe Ridge. And I want you to keep that in mind. But before we move on to wildfire, I also want to alleviate concerns about the septic issue around Lake McDonald and tell you that in 2019, the park also initiated a follow-up survey where they visited um, areas around the perimeter of the lake and collected water samples for fecal coliform analysis. Fecal coliform comes from sewage and they found very low levels, virtually absent around the lake, except for one site had one hit at one colony farming unit per 100 milliliters. And to give you an idea of where that scales up, the uh, criteria for recreational waterways is 126 colony farming units per 100 milliliters, and that's state and federal standards. So this suggests that the septic systems are not an issue on Lake McDonald right now, okay? And so really what this leads to is my favorite topic, which is wildfire. And yes, this is a photo taken from the Lake McDonald Lodge during the Howe Ridge fire. So let's get into fire. You may be asking yourself and very reasonably so, how the heck might a fire enrich a lake with nutrients? And that's a very fair question. And so I'm gonna lean on some precedent for an explanation. Um, in 1988, the Red Bench Fire burned the North Fork portion of the park. Um, so this is a photo of a uh, pole bridge. This is actually the pole bridge burning down during that fire. Very fortunately for me, um, there was researchers that were thinking about fire and aquatic ecosystems uh, actually before my birth. Um, and they went out and they sampled um, uh, uh, creeks in burned watersheds. And I'm just showing you a subset of their data. And here that's Akakola Creek. And their reference creek is an unburned area and that's Logging Creek. So these both burned lakes. This arrow right here indicates when the fire ignited. That was on September 6th of 1988. So the researchers went out immediately to sample these creeks. We're looking at total phosphorus concentrations on the y-axis in this top figure, total nitrogen concentrations on the y-axis in this bottom figure, and time in 1988. And as you can see, 
compared to the reference tributary or reference river, concentrations of total nitrogen were extraordinarily high and phosphorus. And as the fire smolders, they return to more baseline levels. In the years following the fire, during spring snowmelt, concentrations of total phosphorus and total nitrogen shoot up. And then they decline as the season goes on or the growing season goes on. What this suggests is that when a fire is burning, there is wind and deposition of smoke and other particles like charcoal and ash that bring in nutrient rich material to aquatic ecosystems. And that enriches those aquatic ecosystems right away. And we see that here. And in years after fire, particularly during snow melt, as water is scouring things left on the landscape, it's bringing in nutrient rich material to these waterways. And so if you're humor me, um, there was two fires that I think are really relevant to this story. Before that 2018 survey, there was a fire um, called the Sprague Creek Fire. And you may know it as the fire that burned down the Sperry Chalet. And this is just how beautiful it looked <laughs> um, on one night in late August. Um, so in the year following this fire, the lake was sampled. During that same year, another fire sparked up 2018 and that was the Howe Ridge fire. And so this is a photo of the Howe Ridge fire when the folks went out to resample the lake. And as you can imagine, after this fire, there was probably an influx of nutrients as the snow was melting. And after this fire, there was an abundance of smoke in the sky that was depositing materials such as that charred piece of probably vegetation. And this is probably adding to the nutrient load that we were seeing in that lake. Of course, this is just a hypothesis, um, circumstantial evidence at this point. And so what we're doing now is we're creating what's called a nutrient budget for the lake. And what a nutrient budget is, is kind of like balancing your checkbook back when people would do that. So your lake is your checking account and you account for everything coming in and best stuff coming in at this point would be nutrients and all the stuff going out and that would be nutrients. And that balance should be what's maintained in the lake itself. And once we have this robust budget, we can manipulate numbers and see if it actually is possible that the fire the fires caused this enrichment or something else. Um, I'm in the beginning stages of creating this, formulating this nutrient budget. Um, but so far, I do want to share with you that this is not the first nutrient budget that was created for Lake McDonald. The EPA did make a nutrient budget back in 1975. And our numbers are very similar to theirs, which suggests that nutrient inputs to the lake have changed very little since that time period. And that is also great news for Lake McDonald. So stay tuned for more on that front. The second project that I want to tell you about, don't worry, Lake McDonald's still part of this, is um, a series of paleolimnological investigations of lakes and glacier. Um, if you're wondering what the heck paleolimnological means, I'll break it down for you. So the root word paleo is a Latin word, which means ancient, early, prehistoric, or fossil and limnological being the study of inland waters. So what you're doing is you are reconstructing lake conditions, historic lake conditions, and you're using sediment cores to do it. Lakes are very cool and they lay down sediments in chronological order. And in doing so, you are able to reconstruct the ways that that lake was functioning way back in time. Um, and we are trying to do this to understand how nutrient delivery and lake productivity has changed over time and why it has. This is what it looks like. It's very cool. Okay, so we're at the deepest portion of St. Mary Lake. We send down what's called a gravity core. It is essentially like a giant straw with a bunch of weights on it. And we send down a messenger that activates a, a plunger. And then you pull up the core. And it, it works like if you were to plug a straw in a can of soda and then pull up the soda. It's the same principle. It's just a vacuum. 
Once we get the core, we took it back to shore. We put it on this super cool extruding device. And, and for usually the next about six hours of your life, you're slowly pushing this core up and scraping off tiny little portions about the, about the thickness of a quarter, um, 0.25 centimeters if you're interested. And you scrape that off into little baggies and then it goes off to be analyzed. And some of that data I'm gonna show you next. Um, so this is what we're looking at. So um, first, what these cores look like. This is a St. Mary core. It was the longest core at 69 centimeters long. This is the Lake McDonald core. It was 42 centimeters long. And this is the Bowman Lake core that's 20 centimeters long. Up until this point, we've been able to date the upper third of the St. Mary core and the Lake McDonald core. And I'm showing you some of that data over here. Specifically, what we um, analyzed in this upper section of core is the concentration of carbon and nitrogen and algal pigments. So what I'm showing you over here is an algal pigment called Theophyton A, which is an indicator of total algal abundance in the lake. These three lines are from the different lakes. So Bowman Lake is in orange, Lake McDonald's in black, and St. Mary Lake is in blue. And yes, you will see some pretty crazy changes over time, for sure. But what we're not seeing is a contemporary increase in total algal abundance, which is great news. We do not have an indication that these lakes are becoming eutrophied. There's a lot more work to do on this, Specifically, what I'm looking for now is to date the remainder of these cores. There is a ton of information stored in the uh, lower two-thirds section of both the St. Mary and Lake McDonald cores. We have the algal pigments data, we have the nutrients data, but we don't have the dates that they correspond to. And so that is something I'm actively fundraising to do. I just got a grant to measure phosphorus and metals content in the entirety of all these cores. This is very important because phosphorus is generally the primary limiting nutrient in these lakes. And so understanding phosphorus dynamics is imperative to understand algal dynamics. And I'm also going to look at, do a charcoal analysis. And this is the way to reconstruct fire history on these landscapes back before the park was a park and we have fire history records. Very cool stuff. I'm very excited about it. And then the third project, which is my personal passion project. Um, so I call this my pilot mo mountain lake monitoring program. Um, so I received uh, two years ago a Jerry O'Neill Research Fellowship and then in 2023 started the sampling for this fellowship. I expanded my lake sampling in Glacier. It still included Lake McDonald, which I know is a crowd favorite. Okay, but I expanded to include 10 other lakes in the park. Um, and in June and August of 2023, I went and visited the visited all these lakes within a late, uh, one week span, sampled them all, grabbed water samples, collected some fundamental and biological parameters. And what ultimately what I'm trying to do here is provide baseline data for the park, certainly um, demonstrate how a lake monitoring program could slash should <laughs> be implemented. Um, and ultimately, I'm going to be using this data to investigate how uh, watershed wildfires influence limnological conditions throughout Glacier, but also throughout the Mountain West. So this is adding to a big data set I'm working with for my dissertation. Um, I don't have, I'm not showing you data today because I didn't want to overwhelm you with data, but I am going to overwhelm with you with, you with pictures. Um, so, so certainly working on lakes in Glacier is a very glamorous job a lot of the time. A lot of the time you're working in environments that look like this, the sun is out, it's calm, it's perfect. You couldn't be in a better place. It's magical. And you bring water samples back to shore and there's butterflies landing on you and you're filtering and you're just, life is grand. But then there are other days where you are being chased off the mountain wearing a trash bag because a thunderstorm rounded, <laughs> okay? Um, a, or you're choking on smoke and your field assistant is dying of heat stroke. Not actually dying, but suffering from heat stroke. Or you are hypothermic on a boat. <laughs> So it's not always fun and games, but it's 
pretty rewarding for me. And so the last thing I want to end on is really a call to action. Um, so I pulled this from the National Park Service directives under the management policies. And this is under natural resources management. And it states that the mission of the National Park Service is to preserve and protect the natural resources. And this includes lakes in an unimpaired condition to perpetuate their inherent integrity and in perpetuity. I argue that, although impressive, the sporadic sampling of Lake McDonald and other lakes and glacier is simply not enough comprehensive information for the park to fulfill this mission. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing in Glacier. And as glaciers are all too rapidly receding from this landscape, what's being left in their wake is a bunch of lakes. And what people are going to con going to continue to come to Glacier to see is the mountains, the stunning scenery, and the lakes. And it is our collective responsibility as the Glacier community to study them and make sure they are protected. And the best way to do that is through a robust long-term lake monitoring program. I have the will to make this happen, but I need all of your help in finding the way to make this happen. And so with that, I want to thank everyone who has helped keep me afloat these last couple of years as I've been doing my research in Glacier and my PhD. And most especially, I want to thank the Glacier Conservancy and all of its generous donors who have been trusted me to do this research. It's been my privilege and I'm so excited to see what comes next. Brooke, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And, and again, folks, feel free to uh, pop questions in the chat. Um, I'm gonna start, Brooke, um, with kind of following up, you know, you and Chris get to spend some time together on the boat and, and um, to, to your call to action, I'm sure you guys have had conversations about what that might look like. What, what would a program like that look like? And so give us a little bit of more um, of a look under the hood at what you what you think that might look like. Is it an annual thing? Is it every five years? What what would a continued permanent commitment to water quality monitoring and glacier look like? Yes. So obviously there are so many lakes in the park, right? Um, and so it would depend, of course, everything depends. I think that for one, there could be a collection of lakes that are sampled very, very frequently. So like your Lake McDonald's and Bowman and Kintla, things that are front country accessible. And so every year, maybe 10 lakes are sampled on a monthly basis after ice off when it's safe to be on the water and have that monthly sampling. In terms of the lakes that are farther away, obviously it's more difficult to get to them, but I proved that you can sample 11 lakes in seven days. So this is possible, you just need a team to do it. And I think that if you could sort of randomize a systematic random sampling and each year visit a different subset of lakes, maybe on a five-year interval, you could hit a tremendous amount of lakes each year. Um, just for an example, um, when I worked with my spouse in Lassen, we visited 32 lakes, visited and sampled 32 lakes over the course of six weeks. And we were a two person crew. Um, yeah, that, that's really interesting, you know, and I think you yeah. pointed out, you know, there, there isn't um, kind of NPS support. I mean, NPS, I think, ideologically supports this, but support, yeah. in, in an era of declining budget yes. and increased responsibilities, you know, these are the kinds of things that tend to fall by the wayside unless we, um, push for you know, as you say, have the will to, to push for them and, and to find to find the way. Um, so you've got a lot of friends online here. We all love Glacier. So Let's let's um, let's tell Brooke on the, in the chat also. What are your favorite? What's your favorite lake in Glacier? Because we do love our Lake McDonald, but I will tell you, it's not my favorite lake. Not my favorite. I'm a two, I'm a Tumed guy, um, <laughs> you know, and so that that drainage for me is very special. So um, we'll maybe give you some feedback um, about that as well. I mentioned that we're going to give away a couple of books. Uh, they are they are water and fish related. One is 
uh, John McLean's Home Waters. John is uh, Norman McLean's son. He writes kind of about growing up McLean uh, in Montana. Um, and so Home Waters is going to be uh, one of the books we're going to give away. And the other is uh, by Matthew Dickerson, who wrote a book called Voices of Rivers. And he wrote part of it while the artist in residence here in Glacier. Um, and Matthew donates all of the proceeds to his books um, uh, to uh, the Glacier Conservancy, which is really sweet. And Gracie's going to um, put in the chat the winners of, of those two books. So uh, look in the chat for that. Um, and Gracie, I see we've already got a couple of questions. So maybe I'll hand it off to you for a couple of questions and then uh, come back to me. And I want to talk about one of the projects we're uh, looking forward to in 2025. Awesome. Thanks, Doug and Brooke. This is this has been super informative as someone who um, loves loves the lakes and loves to go swimming and is from Minnesota. That's been super interesting. Um, but we definitely have some questions coming up. And one of them is from Lisa. And she was wondering how often um, they are testing the septics on Lake McDonald and if there's a set regular schedule or if it um, is more due to necessity. I think it's more due to opportunity to do so. So the last septic um, survey I know about was the 2017 survey. Um, and that was initiated by the Flathead Lake Biological Station. And I believe that came with support from the Glacier National Park Conservancy to actually do that work. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's just based on um, interest and funding. Awesome, interesting. Um, Kelly asked about the impact of vehicle exhaust on lake water quality, and I was also kind of wondering in a similar but different vein about um, if we're aware of any difference in um, snowpack, like is a higher snowpack going to help the nutrients be less concentrated or is it going to make it more concentrated? And if you know anything about the impacts of vehicle exhaust and snowpack on water quality. Okay, so you have a couple of questions wrapped up into that. So number one, vehicle exhaust. Yes, vehicles do emit um, nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. And so that can produce a fertilizing effect for sure. Um, localized, I'm not sure. Um, that would require some, uh, you know, air water quality transects from roadside to remote areas to see how much that that gas diffuses and if it actually makes it into a water body that would be another study all in itself um there's some pretty terrific work out of uh rocky mountain national park particularly on um, nitrogen deposition and if you're interested i can drop a link in the chat for you um, and I don't know if they specifically addressed vehicle exhaust, but it is a part of that consideration of nitrogen deposition. Um, the second part of that was, remind me, it was, um, was it fire related? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Snowpack. 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 Yeah. Okay, snowpack. So there's two parts to that, right? Snow can have a dilution effect for sure. So if a, in a concentration, right, like you have a certain mass. And so if you add a bunch of water into that, that dilutes that. Um, but the, the thing with snowpack is the more snowpack you have, the more water you have on the landscape and the more that's going to scour materials as it melts. Um, and particularly in burn zones, what tends to form is a hydrophobic layer on that soil surface. Um, and so as the snow is melting, it's not infiltrating the soil and instead it's running off and it's scouring that which is left behind. So the dead and down trees um, down to ash and charcoal. And so you really have this um, kind of heyday <laughs> after, uh, after snow melt where particularly big snow packs can bring in a lot of material. Um, so it, is it, could there be a dilution effect? Yes. Or could it be an an amplification effect? Yes, there's not. There's no real answer to that. We'd have to do more work to figure that out. Super interesting. Um, I'll continue a question on the wildfire train, but okay. um, people are wondering if wildfires in the um, boreal forest of Canada end up affecting glacier lakes quality. Yeah, so um, 
there's there's been one recent study on Castle Lake, California, in which they looked at the way um, uh, d smoke deposition from not localized but regional fires, um, and if that um, increases nutrient concentration specific specifically in one lake. And I don't believe they did find a fertilization effect from smoke specifically. They found other ecological effects. Um, but I know that Jill Barron out of um, uh, Colorado State um, and uh, part of uh, the research in North uh, Northern Rocky Mountains, or sorry, Rocky Mountain National Park. So I'm just thinking about Northern Rocky Mountains all the time. Out of Rocky Mountain National Park, she is looking specifically into smoke deposition and the way that affects the ecology of high elevation lakes. So stay tuned for more on that front. Interesting. Fascinating. Um, Doug, if you want to take it back over and then I can do the giveaway in the chat and then I'll we have a few more questions once here yeah you bet thanks Gracie um appreciate that and uh again Brooke thanks for a super dynamic presentation you know uh, Amy Lucky I think was able to go out with you and she described you both as serious scientist and your absolutely favorite teacher <laughs> uh, right and I think we saw that tonight with some uh you know, I wrote down the checkbook thing. That was really, really clever. And, and <laughs> I, I could understand the straw uh, and the soda. So so thank you for being um, the best teacher. And, and speaking of being good teachers, you know, a lot of people when we do these say, well, this is really interesting, but how can we help? Well, we've got a project uh, this next year where, and picture behind me, um, we are going to try and raise money to hire a student intern from Flathead Valley Community College to help as a fisheries intern. To kind of it's a little bit of a different turn in that it's very fishery specific but to continue work in in surveying uh the lakes and streams in the park uh it's a 14 it's eighteen thousand dollar um uh i'm sorry it's a eighteen thousand dollar fourteen thousand dollar project um we're starting the fundraising for that this year and we're going to put a link in the chat if that moves you um that's a great way to help continue um the work uh in uh, in the glaciers waterways um, and also create a really cool opportunity for a local uh, a local student so um, again if that interests you um, we'd love to have your help um, gracie and i'll hand it back over to you perfect thanks doug um i first want to read you some of the answers of the favorite lake we had bowman multiple swift current we had harrison and all of them francis we do have some joy for Lake McDonald. There are several favorite in Lake McDonald. And then we have some in Tumed. So definitely people are loving all those glacier lakes. Um, Brent was wondering if, Brooke, you were behind the plastic survey in Lake McDonald two years ago, if that was your work. It's not my work, but it's fascinating. And I know that there's been more work on more lakes regarding plastics from atmospheric deposition. I believe there was a new article that just came out in Science about it. Um, I would, I'll drop that in the chat. I'll figure it, I'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> and he also was wondering if you're doing any um, lake research in subalpine area, like he gave some examples of Upper Grinnell, Poya or Old Man, but yeah. Um, I have not been exploring uh, subalpine landscapes yet. Um, usually it's not a lack of interest, but a lack of, frankly, money. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes time to make those things happen. Um, certainly fires uh, do occur in the subalpine. Um, they seem to be occurring more frequently in some areas of the Rocky Mountain subalpine. So far, the North Cap or the North Northern Rocky Mountains appear to be within the historic range of variability, but that's expected to um, not be the case in the years to come. And so there's a lot of interest in understanding those wildfire dynamics. Um, and I can also drop you some, some research if, in case you want to read more about it. Awesome. Yeah, that is super interesting. And I think it's a, a general theme in research that there's always maybe more to be studied than uh, funding for the the studies <laughs> too much to be done <laughs> yes exactly um, Gracie, thank you for uh, choosing our winners Tim Christensen and Janet Bones congratulations uh, books will be on their way uh, to you that's uh, I've, I've read them both we've actually done them as part of the Glacier Book Club so um, there are events like this you can also pull up on YouTube with the authors uh, 
in, in that regard. And, and keep bringing the questions. We've got some great questions and still about uh, 13 minutes. So keep them coming. Yes. Thank you for reminding me to read the names, Doug. Um, Brooke, Lisa was wondering if uh, where the results for the paleolimnological study of course samples it. <laughs> um, will be published when it's complete or um, how will the public be able to learn the results? Yes. Um, so first and foremost, at the end of this year, December of 2024, we will be giving a final report on these two projects, both to the park and the conservancy. Um, and then I will pursue publication in one or two scientific journals. Um, I have not nailed down what those are, but I believe the public should have access to academic journals. And so whenever I can provide you with what those are, um, I will be sure to um, provide those links to the Conservancy in whatever way possible. Awesome, that'll be great. I'm sure um, we'd all be super interested in seeing yeah. those results. And um, I, um, I will say again, actively fundraising to get those bottom parts of the course. So we have that complete chronology right now. We don't know how far back in time those cores go. We have all the information about the lake conditions, but we just don't know how far back in time the St. Mary Lake and the and the Lake McDonald core goes. And so if you hear of any avenues for funding to make that happen, please let me know. Yeah, I was going to say, Brooke, talk to us a little bit more and don't be shy about that. Um, you know, I we're a believer in community fundraising and the rising tide floats yeah. all the boats. Is is that something where you're looking for grant money? Is that something where the Flathead Biological Station would be a, a, a vehicle for that or... or um, given that we don't have a continuing grant in 2025 related to this, how, how would that um, how would that go forward? Yeah, so I I could be awarded funds personally to make it happen. Um, there's not a ton of work that needs to be done. It's just a, a small collection of samples that would need to be sent out to an appropriate lab to do the C14 analysis. Um, C14 is a radioactive material, so you have to be careful, and I don't have the proper lab to do that myself. Um, but for instance, like, you know, if you're looking for a ballpark estimate about what something like that would cost, it would be around $3,000. Great. That's helpful. Thank you. A small grant. This is perhaps a question for both Doug and Brooke, but do you have any recommendations for books that discuss ecology of Glacier National Park? It's pretty broad, and I know Doug's a big reader, which is why I may be posing it to him as well. <laughs> I think Doug's your guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I. it's interesting. I don't, I don't know of one off the top of my head that... Um, I don't know if Dave Stanley or others are on the on the call. Feel free to unmute and and give us your information. Or Andrew Smith, you may you may know too. But specific to that, I I don't know that there really is a seminal book about that. Andrew, do you have any ideas? Yes, I was just about to drop a link in the chat to shop.glacier.org. It's a a little bit dated now, but in my opinion, the Rockwell uh, Natural History Guide is the best one that's out right now. Gotcha. And Andrew uh, comes to us from the National Park Service. He was one of the founding rangers of the Headwaters podcast. Um, and uh, we we pilfered him from the park and we um, are never mm -hmm. going back. So um, <laughs> thank you, Andrew. That's super helpful. I have yeah. not read that. So I have to put that on my uh, my summer beach. It sounds like a great beach read. You know, it, as far as uh, yeah, a guidebooks go, it's it's pretty readable. Nice, nice. That's awesome. Gracie, shall I take a minute? And uh, and uh, I see that Brooke has taken a uh, drink of water, which might mean she's prepared for the speed round. Yes, that's a good idea. We don't want... Right. I need like a I bell need... to ring or something to, uh, <laughs> to connote the speed round. But uh, those of you who are familiar with Glacier Conversations and Book Clubs, we always uh, do a speed round with our author. So I have some um, some special to Brooke Granerman um, uh, speed round questions. Um, so the, I promised a Seinfeld question um, because we had had this discussion that you are a Seinfeld aficionado. So favorite non-Jerry, I'm giving you a choice of two, Kramer or George? 
Dort. Dort. Sure, okay, Dort. very good. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you had mentioned that you are a uh, mountain bike rider. Yes. So, so when you're going out mountain biking in the Missoula area, Discovery Bike Park or Legacy Bike Park? Legacy. Legacy. Okay, very good. Um, we'll we'll continue in the Missoula area, and um, we're going to go um, to my friend Tim O'Leary's um, great music venue out on the river there. And you've got a choice of two concerts for this summer. Okay. And it's it's duos. You can go to Jewel and Melissa Etheridge on the 11th of July, or Robert Plant and Allison Krauss on the 8th of August. Probably Robert Plant and Allison Krauss. Uh, so is that for Allison Krauss? Is that how you came to that? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I think they're just more. Yeah, they're. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big uh, Allison Krauss guy. Okay, so now we're going to go back to Bellingham. Okay. And are we going to go to the original structures or are we going to go to structures Old Town? You know, I haven't been to the new structures, but I can tell you that the old structures, you had to sit on um, like old whiskey barrels. <laughs> So if the chairs have been upgraded, I'll go with new structures. <laughs> okay, all right. So, we, so we're gonna do that. That probably will be your first stop then of the two to check yeah. out what's <laughs> eating. Okay, good. So I have two more questions. One, we also um, share a, a strange affi affinity for deadliest catch. Yeah. So um, you got a choice of two captains, Sid okay. Hansen or the late Phil Harris. Late Phil Harris. Okay, the correct answer, by the way. All right, yeah. and last. It, we, you and I are both fishermen, so are, are we going dry fly or nymph? I do like dry fly. I, I okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> well, that's that's awesome. Thank you for playing our game. Yeah. Uh, good answers. We know a little bit more about you. Um, I was impressed by the uh, the schedule of concerts this year. Um, out yeah. of the house. they're I've all sold been. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Well, um, Tim's a good friend of the conservancies as well, and um, so. Uh, yeah, that'd be that'd be fun to get out there. Okay, so Gracie, there are a couple more questions. I think we can sneak in in the last six minutes. I know Stacy had a couple, and uh, it's really terrific to have so many great questions uh, from all around the country. Yeah, um, Gary was interested in how often you are sharing your findings in Glacier with other scientists doing similar work in other national parks or state parks, and how that kind of highlights are shared. Um, as often as possible. Um, one of my committee members is Jill Barron, who started the Lockvale um, Water uh, Monitoring Program in Rocky Mountain National Park. So she is one of my best collaborators for sure. Um, and we're always talking about lakes and fires in particular. Um, I certainly have been in kind of the get the data stage of my PhD. And now it's more of the working with the data stage of my PhD. And so this is really where the sharing and collaboration starts. Um, so I would say I'm in the beginning stages of that. That's awesome. Yeah. At the Conservancy as well, uh, collaboration is one of our core values. So it's always fun to hear about how other yeah. people are doing it. Yeah. Um, I, I have a double question from Stacy, but it's what has been your most memorable experience out on the lakes? And then what has been the most challenging sampling experience? Okay. Um, memorable experience has definitely been uh, pulling the sediments out of the bottom of Lake McDonald, St. Mary, and, and Bowman. Um, there's something really special about the thought of, you know, these lakes have been around since the deglaciation about 10,000 years ago. So they've seen history that humans have not. Um, and so hidden within these sediments is kind of the mysteries, you know. Uh, so taking those out of the bottom of the lake was really exciting for me. And I I really wanted to see what secrets they held. Um, and the fact that it just went so darn well. <laughs> uh, we were pretty concerned about whether or not we could make it happen. And, and um, we got all those cores on the first try so that it does not get better than that. Um, the hardest day on the boat, I actually showed you the video of um, 
both times when I visited Snyder Lake, it's a beautiful lake, but uh, it's kind of cursed for me. I think um, the first time I was chased off the mountain in a lightning storm, and the second time it rained so hard that my my helper Leah and I were just shivering on the boat, damn near hypothermia, and ran off the mountain with trash bags over our head. And I just I just don't feel like Snyder Lake's my lake anymore. I I agree with you. I've I've been there a couple of times, and and in really, really nice weather at Lake McDonald and you get up there and is like we terrible a couple of weeks ago and it was there was snow everywhere it was windy it was cold it just um yeah yeah um, it's a hard hike up there too but there are also really cut nice cutthroat trout I believe it <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, a fair challenge that doesn't sound like the most ideal out in the field no Warmer and drier is better. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, kind of a follow up is if you have any memorable wildlife moments. Any yes, specific. I, I do. Um, I, I that's don't. That's a good. You... That's a good culminating question. I think. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. Um, uh, if you uh, if I'm still able to share my screen. Yeah, um, you can. So and and he's actually I hope still on the on the call. Um, but my one of my dear friends, uh, Nico Kinestead, he's a science teacher that uh, drove all the way out to Glacier to help me sample when we can shown here, and my trusty field tech, Carly Enos, and um, my husband, we all went out to sample um, logging lake. And it was a terribly smoky day. And uh, on the way back, we were hot and exhausted and uh, put our backpacks in the car, which happened to contain our bear spray. And we all agreed that a dip in the creek was a great idea. And so we walked over to Logging Creek and we were just lying in the creek trying to cool off. And then you hear that noise that everyone knows, the crash of the bushes. And my husband says, and there's the bear. And I look up and the bear is probably 20 feet from Nico, who's shown right here. Um, and it was a grizzly. Fortunately, he took no interest in us and walked right on by. Um, but that was probably one of the scarier moments of my life. I thought I thought my, one of my best friends might die. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> wow. And that was the last bear I've seen in Glacier, which is, I'm good with that for now. <laughs> right. I like seeing them at the dis at a distance. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's a, that's a, you know, there are lots of great, um, uh, lots of great and difficult bear stories and, and others uh, in the park. And I think you can unshare maybe now. Yes, I will unshare. So we can. You can wrap up. Perfect. Um, well, uh, we have reached our time together and, um, Brooke, thank you so very much for, uh, giving us the, the grace of your time tonight. And, uh, more importantly for the way that you have committed to this place that means so much to, to all of us that, um, for you to become so quickly, such an impactful member of the Glacier family and to bring your passion and energy and commitment and intellectual acuity to this work. Um, is really a blessing. It makes what we do, what all of us do as donors and supporters of the Conservancy, um, it makes it real, right? We can't do anything at the Conservancy without our donors. Similarly, we can't do anything without you, the people on the ground who make the magic happen. So thank you for being dedicated to that. Thank you for sharing um, with us tonight. And we look forward to um, more uh, from you and with you um, yeah. in the future and um, thanks again to a great uh, group tonight thanks for a really great back and forth and and for another terrific truly glacier conversation um, again I'm Doug Mitchell and um, on behalf of all of us at the Conservancy thanks for all your support and all you do and we'll look forward to seeing you on a trail in the park soon good night everybody <laughs>